I used to be an abstract painter when I was in art school as an abstract geometric painter. And I painted a lot like Al Held and really cloned his paintings in a sense for a year or two. And um, when I changed over and started painting from observation, one of the reasons was that I didn't want to be so damn self-conscious about my painting. And when I looked at these, when I was making my own images up, I'd look and I'd say, now, should this be a symmetrical painting or an asymmetrical painting? And I found the question annoying, because you could make a beautiful or a lousy asymmetrical painting, or make a beautiful or a lousy symmetrical painting. What was the point in discussing this? Why not just look at something and paint it the way it is? Plop. And that's what I did. People often say to me, why do you pick such banal subjects? And I don't understand that at all. They don't seem to be banal to me in the least. They're full of magic. There is an agenda here. And you know, one of the funny things about landscape is that on the whole, the weight is on the ground. And the sky is airy and light and there's not much solid up there. Even when there's a lot of clouds, they're sort of fleecy and soft and, and so on, and vaporous, and the weight is on the bottom. So it interested me very much to put the weight on the top. And that means standing under a bridge is one of the best ways to do that. When people on the street say, it looks real, I think what they really mean is it looks like a photograph, and that photography has become the standard of reality and representation now. I came from a very uh, flamboyant household, very theatrical, very, very hi histrionic household. Everything was exaggerated. You never knew what anyone meant. And uh, I didn't like it. And I didn't trust my own histrionics either, and, uh, or strong asp affect or whatever it is. And um, in my paintings, I try to get all that out and state it exact. No, no, that's not the way that air conditioner sits in that window. Do it again, Downs, and get it right this time, the way it really is. And I love that. And I love feeling I have now got it. Banal or not, I don't care. I grew up in a household with my cousins, with five cousins and an older sister. Everyone was older than me. I was the squirt. And I did start on solitary pleasures quite early. I did. That's curious, isn't it? It was true. When I was in, in school in England, I was an unbeatable long-distance runner. That's not a team sport. <laughs> you know? And I think that personal... Yeah, there's some, there are deep personal reasons, I'm sure, for these things, but I'm not quite sure what they are. The detail comes in because you have to figure out how to move from here to here and then to here, and then to here. And every size division, you make this block without any windows, and you're not sure whether it really is comfortably that size. As soon as you get those windows in there, you get clearer and clearer and clearer about what it is. And in order to move about and stay, keep these things in proportion, I need all these things. When I was an undergraduate, I uh, studied English literature in Cambridge in England. And we used to sit around and discuss these poems and what made them great. And then we would write poems of our own and say, you see, this poem has this and this and this. It must be a great poem. Well, somehow it wasn't. <laughs> the thing that attracted me was that it was a huge, open, but enclosed space. Because there is a ring of these low hills or these low mesas, these long, flat hills all the way around it, so to speak, on all sides. And um, inside it are these tiny little structures. So that's the theme from those things. And the structures are light on the land, and I like that. If I went to this space, yeah. would I see this? I have no idea whether you'd see that or not. I don't know. I, it's my job to find places that answer to some internal need. I think that there's an internal need before you get to the place and that the, the place answers the need. Sometimes there's an agenda, like let's put the weight on top, but there's also just an inarticulate need. And I think that um, you might not respond to it, you know, at all. You might not have, you might have said, what on earth is that? You know, look at that miserable area out there, you know. One of the issues was that I'd been painting in flatscapes in New Jersey and the Texas coast for about 10 years, and I thought it'd be great fun to make a mountain. Could you paint a mountain without being sentimental about mountains? 
without being falling victim to the mountain rhetoric. You know, look at this tremendous canyon that's so deep, and look at this terrifying crag up over your head and all that business. I don't dig that mountain rhetoric. Too. I'm not interested in rhetoric at all. I think that artists, uh, people who are active in another art form, even if it be writing or music or something, are often very, very perceptive critics of a different art form, you know, a writer writing about painting or something, because they realize the limitations of criticism. Criticism can't, can't do everything, it can't explain everything, and it can't make certainties. There are no certainties in art. What is your take on the, the professional artist's life? Oh, it's dreadful. Is it? Oh, yes. It's uncertain and miserable, and every day you feel pressured to do something extraordinary and unusual. And, uh, you know, it has its problems. It really does. Yeah, it does. And, you know, the vagaries of fashion whisk you in and whisk you out again and give you an income and take it away again. <laughs> you know. I used to think that my paintings, I was basing my aesthetic here um, on various existing things, but they were literary rather than painting. There was a statement of Stendhal's when he, he wrote to his sister. He had a younger sister, Stendhal, and uh, he was living in Paris and his sister was still at home in Grenoble and they had a correspondence. And he gave her some advice on letter writing. And he said, only write about matters that you feel very strongly about. When you put them into words, try to do it as though you didn't want anyone to notice. And I thought that was stunningly brilliant, and I felt exactly the same way. I will say this, though, that all of us that are painters or artists or poets, or whatever it is, we spend quite a big chunk of every day doing the thing we really want to do. And that cannot be said by lots of people.